How's it going everyone? And welcome back to this journey into making a video game guitar cover. Now, this week we're going to be talking about mixing, but before we do that, there is something I want to talk about very briefly, and that is ear fatigue. Um, ear fatigue is... So if you're listening to the same thing over and over and over again for hours, you will start to make worse and worse decisions about the mixing for that. Now, luckily, I'm in a position where I I have presets and stuff, and I know what works, so I'm able to um, mix things without having to worry too much about ear fatigue, but if you're just starting out, once you've finished recording the, th the thing, like I have here, then take a break, even if it's for the entire rest of the day and come back to it the next day. Just take the time to chill, let this song sink in, and then come back to do the mixing, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're just going to do the most basic of uh, leveling and stuff. Uh, so we're going to level. I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about top-down mixing, which is an approach that I've just learned how to do. Um, but this is the point at which you're probably going to hear a little bit of feedback into my microphone because I'm not using headphones right now. Um, we're going to start actually by turning everything except for all these toms and cymbals and stuff all the way down like this. Uh, the reason why I'm not turning down the toms, the cymbals, and the overheads uh, is because they're all being affected by the sums here, and it's just more efficient to turn those down instead. Then we'll take everything else. Uh, trick is if you press, if you click on a track and then press control and click on the other tracks that you want to turn down, then... Uh, you select all of them. It's quite literally just a basic Windows function anyway. Uh, another little thing is that if you press Shift, it does actually select multiple tracks like that, but it also selects the buses, which I don't want to be doing, and it also selects all these, which I don't want to be adjusting either. Um, but I use all those leads, and then we have the dub leads here. And then if you press Alt and Shift in Cubase, you can drag them all down at once. I believe in Logic Pro, when you have all the tracks selected, they all get affected together when you do this, but I please don't quote me on that. So now what we're going to do is turn up the speakers. Quite high as well. Not fully. Uh, you still want to have a little bit of up and down, but have it quite high, and that will give you a better picture of uh, the bass frequency specifically at lower levels. Because if you're mixing really low, uh, the bass frequencies don't have time to reach full amplitude, and therefore you don't hear the bass frequencies that well. Now, this is... Uh, best improved as well with a subwoofer, but I don't have a subwoofer, so I'm, I generally have to guess on the bass stuff. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start turning up everything in relation to the kick drum. The kick drum is the baseline foundation of everything here. So, I'm going to base everything that I do on what the kick drum is, is like. So, I'm going to quickly do a mix. I'm going to speed up, and I'll probably tell you a little bit about things as I'm going. Uh, but we're going to start with the kick drum and work our way up. And I'm going to pick a section that has a good chunk of stuff. Okay, so I didn't actually explain anything during this process, so let me just explain while I'm going. So, let's go. First, we bring up the kick drum. Now, the level of the kick will determine the level of everything else. That means you don't want it too loud or too quiet. It'll depend on what kick you're using. For the patch of the P5 kit I have, I usually end up around minus 11 or 12 dB on the fader. Sometimes I end up higher if I don't have my speakers loud enough, so make sure you give yourself enough volume to mix properly. Next for the snare, bring it up until it sounds like it's level with the kick drum, especially in double bass sections later on in my particular arrangement of this song. Make sure it's loud enough before EQ and compression that it's not being drowned out by the kick. But you can't have it too loud, otherwise it sticks out too much compared to everything else. Next on the toms, go to a section with a tom fill and mix them relative to the snare. Perhaps just a little quieter, but as close as you can. For the overheads, they're an interesting case. This is an example of something you'll more likely be automating based on the section. The hi-hat is louder than the ride, but mix it based on the volume of the hi-hat as opposed to the volume of the ride. Make the hi-hat fit before the ride. And for the rooms, base this on how it makes the snare sound. I bring it up until the snare starts to sound like it's quite reverb strong, but not so strong it drowns out the close mic character of the snare itself. This you'll also be automating based on the section, but not based off volume of another sound, but more likely you'll be basing it off of how big you want the kit to feel in that particular section. I'll explain more in a later video. Okay, so once we get to this point, I'm now going to go to the bass. That is the next level of this, and I'm going to actually start clear the way over here.
For clean bass, bring it up relative to the kick. It should mesh quite well even without the EQ or compression just by itself, but bring it up so you can hear the notes of the bass, but not so high that the finger pick noise is piercing. If the noises are too loud, then just re-record it or adjust your tone. For distortion bass, it's the same process, but just be more mindful of the high frequency noises of the distortion. It's pretty leveled. Uh, so now I'm going to move on and I'm going to do the leads specifically. And the reason why I do the leads uh, is because you get a a better idea of where the rhythms guitar the rhythm guitars need to be in relation to the leads if you do the leads first. Uh, so let's start there. For the leads, bring up the main lead parts, the main melodies, up to be a bit louder than the bass. They shouldn't be so loud that they drown out the bass in any given section, but not so quiet that they'll end up buried by the rhythm guitars later. For harmonies and backing parts, bring them up so you can barely audibly hear them, and then bring them up a tiny bit higher. This should make them mesh quite well with the parts without feeling overbearing. You may have to adjust these in the final mixing stages, but for now they'll suffice. You may also end up having to automate them just depending on the section. I don't normally have to, but just something to consider. Okay, now before I bring in the um, dub leads here specifically, we're actually going to bring in the rhythm guitars. I say that, we're actually going to start with the clean guitars. No, I, I, I do lie, it is actually the rhythm guitars I want to do first. For rhythm guitars, bring them up so they feel just ever so slightly quieter than the leads. The leads should be the focus, but the rhythms also need to feel present. This is a delicate balancing act. Also, watch you're not burying the bass too much, but also don't bring up the bass too much. Also, make sure that you're not burying the kit as a whole. It's a whole debacle in and of itself. And on these backing rhythm guitars, if you do the quad tracking like I do with the octaver guitar, do the same thing like you did with the harmonies and backing parts for the leads, but bring them down just a tiny bit. Okay, now I'm going to bring in the clean guitars. Clean guitars should be mixed in like you did with the backing lead parts. Bring them up until you can just barely audibly hear them, but bring them down just slightly. They're a bit more percussive, but should still be tonal. Delicate balancing act. Okay, and then finally, gonna bring in the dub leads here. Now when bringing up dub stuff like this, solo out uh, the instrument that the dub stuff is in relation to. So like, I have lead two, lead main two, uh, and then the two dub leads are happening underneath it in this section. Also bring them up until you can barely audibly hear them in the mix. Bring them up based on solo and then adjust in the full mix. So now, when unsoloed, Remember, it should always be a textural element in this case. Um, and speaking of textural elements, let's bring up these synthesizer things. We'll start back here. Same situation with these, bring them up until you can barely hear them in the mix. Then the strings. So a good way to tell if something is actually helping with the mix is to mute it and unmute it. Um, is to mute it and unmute it. And if you hear nothing happening, then either turn it up or get rid of it entirely. If it's not adding anything, you might as well just get rid of it. 
now let's bring up this white noise crap. Another same situation. Barely audibly hear it and all that. You get it. Okay, cool. A little bit too loud, though. Some of these effects are also based on the bass frequencies as opposed to the high frequencies, and those are more felt rather than heard. So if you can't hear it, don't turn it up more so you can. Sweet. And that is, that's everything leveled out. Uh, so we should be good to move on to the next thing that I want to talk about, which is top-down mixing. Now, technically, you would have added this beforehand, and like it's, it's a bit of a weird process I don't fully understand just yet, but uh, I'm going to tell you right now that in order to do the uh, processing that I do, there is an alternative way to do it that uses just stock plugins, but I'm not going to do it. In fact, for most of what I'm doing, I'm not even going to be using stock plugins at all, but I could make basically the same mix using just stock plugins. So, uh, if you look up here at the routing, I have sent every bus except for the lead bus here to a master bus. And um, all of those go into here, right here. And that means that if I were to just solo this, I have just, I have everything except for the main melodies. Apparently this is actually really freaking quiet though. But that's fine, that's kind of how you want it to be. Um, so what you do for this, uh, first thing I will say, Slate Digital, I love your plugins, but God, please switch away from a friggin' subscription-based service. It would save me money. Um, anyway, VBC Rack is what I use for this. Um, and what you... Uh, this is just keeping... I would use specific... Okay, so I use specifically the FG Grey and the FG Red compressors, and those, if you saw here, they're both individual separate things, but this plugin just keeps them all together. Uh, so that way it's just one plugin instead of two separate ones. So, what I'm going to do is have this set up roughly uh, how I would have it. And here's how a compressor works. A compressor is a dynamic volume fader, is how I would put it. Um, so what it does is you have this threshold command here and this ratio command here. Or a knob, I guess. And what these are is they're, they are... So the threshold specifically is the number of decibels, which is loudness stuff, the number of decibels the signal has to be at in order for the compressor to activate, and the ratio is how much compression happens. Um, so think of a compressor like just dropping a volume fader whenever a certain threshold is hit. Is hit. Um, so what I'm about to do is just this master glue compression, uh, is what it's called. Um, there are multiple different ways to compress things, and we'll talk about them a little bit more once I get into the actual mixing side of things. Or the uh, EQing and compressing and stuff like that. So, specifically for master glue like this, you'll want the ratio set pretty high. Threshold set just so, but keep it at zero for right now. Drop the attack to three and the release as low as it can be on FG Grey. Then this high pass frequency, this actually doesn't, so a high pass frequency, if we grab an EQ here, uh, a high pass frequency is if I take like this cut 48. So uh, this, is, this is our frequency, this is the cutoff. High pass is I let everything in the high end pass through. Uh, the opposite is true in terms of a low pass, where I just let all the low stuff pass through, etc, etc. Now the high pass frequency here is not going to work the same way as it would do in an EQ. This is what the compressor sees and is trying to compress. 
For glue compression like this, the compressor is actually going to be hit by a lot of the low end, the 60 hertz of the kick, pretty hard. And that's going to bring everything down. So, you'll want to set this just so. I usually set it right about 75, and that's usually enough. And then we'll adjust the threshold once we get to the mastering stage, because that's the last thing that needs to happen. I don't need to be compressing it before I do EQ and stuff, because gain is not going to be exactly the same for the for the first little bit of that. It's probably a it's probably my fault because of how I do mixing, but it should be fine. Uh, we'll not adjust the threshold on this yet, but I also use FG Red. Um, so I do slightly weaker settings here. Uh, but the attack and release are still very low. Increase the high pass frequency, but this mix knob is also something that I'll be using during this. Now the mix knob is how much of the signal that you're hearing through your speakers is actually what's being compressed. So if I have it on 100%, like I have it up here, 100% of the signal that we will be hearing is what's coming out of the compressor. If I turn it all the way down, it might as well be bypassed. Um, but I'm gonna set this around 25%, and this is gonna be basically a parallel compression, um, which I'll talk a lot about a little bit more once we get to the drums. So, uh, this is how I'll have these set up, but we'll adjust the compressor uh, threshold on all of these later. Uh, but this is the top-down stuff that you'll do for this. But on the main out, we're going to add Infinity EQ, which is my favorite EQ that I use for everything. But again, you could get away doing this without uh, Infinity EQ. You could use stock plugins and it would have the same effect. So what I'm going to do for this... Uh, okay, an equalizer is a volume fader for specific frequencies. Uh, the human ear can hear from 20 to 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Um, which, you don't need to know what hertz means. All you need to know is that, like, 20,000 hertz is really, really high, and 20 hertz is really, really low, and anything above or below that you can't actually even hear if you have absolutely perfect hearing. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to tame some frequencies that I don't particularly like. Uh, this is just, this is called subtractive EQ, specifically. And it's something that I always do right at the start of the final mastering stage. So the very first thing I'm going to listen to is the high end, right up here. And I happen to know that right about here, right around 5.48 kilohertz, is a particular set of frequencies that I don't like with the tones that I have. I also happen to know that right around 1,000, 1, 1 1.2 kilohertz is a sound that I don't particularly enjoy. I also happen to know that right around 500 is, a, is an EQ or a, a frequency that I don't particularly enjoy. And finally, right around 130. 40, 150 is a frequency that I don't particularly enjoy. Sorry, doing a little bit of adjusting to the mixing. The lead stone is a little bit buried there. This is what I would do on EQ stuff here. Just, just these moves. They're not massive, like 1.68 decibels. You're probably not even really going to hear that, but it does make a massive difference. Tames the high end a little bit. And then, Virtual Tape Machine. One of my all-time favorite plugins that I use for absolutely everything. Um, so, a lot of music that you know is recorded, or a lot of old music that you know has been recorded on tape machines. Um, and there's a certain kind of distortion that is created on tape. On tape, um, There's this natural degradation that it has. Uh, 
And based on what you do with these settings, we'll determine what that degradation is. Uh, certain different characters. I don't really hear much of a difference between them. I just set them to this just because I know it works for a kick drum and I quite like how it sounds on a kick drum and it works perfectly fine here. So I set the speed of the reels here to 15 inches per second. That's the number of inches that go past the playhead. It's a massive thing that I don't have time to get into here. Uh, I use the FG456 tape type on a two inch 16 track tape machine, uh, biased normally. I don't adjust the input or output, it's just a light little thing. Oh yeah, something else to note, If I, I may want to turn down the makeup gain here, the makeup gain is like, when you're compressing things you'll want to, when you're compressing things it lowers the volume of the overall source. Uh, so you use makeup gain to turn it back up, but I think part of my issue right now is the fact that these compressors are just naturally loud and they make the signal a little bit louder. That should be good. I'm hearing another little thing here. That was it. But yeah, this is what I do with Virtual Type Machine. And we're not going to add anything else. You're supposed to add a limiter on the end here, which is what FGX is, which I'm going to be using for this mix, which I've never actually used before. Um, but we're, I'm not going to do this just yet. We'll, we'll get to that once we actually get to the mastering stage. Instead, um, I actually think that just about covers everything. <laughs> uh, the last thing I want to talk about here is that you should never, under any circumstances, have your um, these meter peak levels that are right here. The level, it's basically the loudness of your source. You don't want it to ever go above zero. You'll notice it's all, it's all in negative numbers. If it goes above zero, then you get digital clipping, which is not the most pleasant of sounds in the world. So, you're going to want to stay below that, and you'll notice, like... In the mix overall, like the level is kind of around like eight or nine, I think it was. Okay, right around 12. That's actually a, a good place. That's usually where I have it anyway. So, anyway, uh, you don't want to go above zero because you don't want digital distortion, and digital distortion sounds bad, but you need to go above zero by about two or three dBs, or like another, I think it's actually another six decibels before you even get distortion. So, you do have a bit of leeway, but just avoid going above zero in general. Uh, but that is all I want to talk about for, uh, for this video. So, next time we're going to take a look at adding um, EQ compression, reverb, and other effects and stuff like that. Um, so, Thank you guys very much for joining me. See you in the skies, Dragonites. All the best, and take care.